do is introduce a few basic permaculture concepts, but I'm going to put almost all of it in the context of water conservation uh, just to show how permaculture can be applied to really almost anything. It came out of the garden, uh, but, but it turns out that it's a really universal design approach for designing almost anything. So we'll get a sense of this as this goes on. I'm going to be sneaking in a lot of concepts under the heading of water conservation, uh, sort of what we call in permaculture stacking functions, where we're doing more than one thing at a time. So ostensibly we're talking about water conservation, but I think you'll see we're going to be talking about a lot of other things as well. This photograph here is a garden in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and the climate is not too different from here. This is about 7,400 feet, and it's a, it's a dry you know, New Mexico, dry climate, high desert, and they only get about 8 to 12 inches of rain a year um, with very dry, cold winds in the wintertime. And this garden was designed using permaculture, and the owner, Mary Zemak, almost never waters her garden. She can go for months without watering because she has applied so many different strategies, so many different techniques for keeping her garden moist, keeping the water in the soil. So what I'm going to do right now is just show you these eight different methods that she uses really quickly. And then I'm going to go into each one so you don't need to scribble down this, this list of eight. But what, what, she, what we're doing in permaculture is we're, we're developing strategies, right? We have a goal like water conservation, and so we make a plan. How do, what are all the different ways that we can conserve water? So we have strategies, which are kind of the planning we're doing, and then we figure out a bunch of techniques to make those strategies happen. And what I mean by strategies are things like we raise the amount of organic matter in the soil. That, that will help it hold more water. We put down mulches. That's another strategy, and there are a lot of different ways to do mulching. We contour the soil so it will hold rain or hold any water on it. We plant really densely so that there is not a lot of sun directly hitting, hitting the ground. We arrange the plants by water need. This is sort of like xeriscaping, but it's, a lot, it's, it's actually a lot more interesting than that. We harvest the rain that we do get, and we reuse water whenever we can, and we're careful about how we water. So these are eight different strategies that we're using, and what these things do is they all come together so that Mary can go two or three months without watering in the high desert in New Mexico. So I think a lot of us here would like to be able to do that as well. She, I mean, look at this garden. It's lush and beautiful and productive. It's an amazing place. She has tons of fruit, tons of flowers, lots of vegetables, and she hardly ever waters except when she's getting little seedlings going. There's something that's becoming very trendy these days called Hugel culture, which are German words for mound culture. And this is where you dig a trench in the ground and you put in woody matter, just you know, old rotten firewood or logs or brush or that sort of thing, and you build it up into a mound and then you put some soil over it. This illustration is showing uh, sod that you've cut out of somewhere, maybe cut out from where you're building the Hugel culture bed, and you lay it down and then you put some soil on it and then you plant into this. And what's going on is the wood down in that trench is soaking up water whenever it rains, because rotting wood is really good at holding a lot of water. And I actually helped build one of these in Montana when I was living there over the summer at a ranch we were on outside of Billings, um, also a very dry climate. And this was a ranch. We had a backhoe, so we dug an enormous trench that was six feet deep and 80 feet long. We drug some big cottonwoods that had fallen and laid those down in the trench and then piled a bunch of brush and then went out and got some big round bales that had rotted, you know, 1,000 pounds of hay. And we put six round bales into the thing and just made this massive pile of organic matter that was six feet into the ground and about five feet high. And during the Montana winter, there was so much heat being generated by that that a lot of the plants that we put on, the cover crops, the fava beans and other cover crops like that, made it through the winter just fine. And during the summer, it hardly ever needed to be irrigated because that rotting wood was holding so much water. So you don't have to make them that big. You can make them you know, <laughs> modest in your yard. But if you've got a backhoe, it's, it's a lot of fun. 
But you can see here's a, a little more modest example of a, of a fugal culture bed. But it's holding water, and as the organic matter, as the, the wood in it breaks down, it's releasing nutrients, and it's good habitat for, for our, our fungal friends. So it's doing a whole bunch of things as well. Another way to stack layers to keep light from hitting the soil is something in permaculture that we call guilds. And this is a kind of mysterious concept, but, but it's actually very easy. A lot of folks wonder, you know, what, what is this idea of guilds? And what we're doing is creating plant communities out of the plants that, that we want. You know, if we go out in nature, plants almost always form groupings, communities or associations where, you know, underneath a dug fir, there are usually a certain kind of, tr of other shrubs and, and other vegetation. And underneath a, an, an oak, there'll be characteristic plants that go with the oak. So we're learning from nature about creating plant communities by creating these guilds. The, the most common ancient guild is corn, beans, and squash. Uh, the, you know, I think we all know this one, where the corn forms a trellis for the beans. The beans are nitrogen fixers, so they build fertility, and the squash forms a living mulch and keeps the soil cool. And corn, beans, and squash turns out to yield more as a combination in a given area if, than if you planted one of those plants alone, like an acre of corn or an acre of beans or an acre of squash won't yield as much as an acre of corn, beans, and squash together. You'll get more calories, more food out of it, because they all, all the plants kind of nest into one another and fill up spaces that the others are not using. So that's really kind of the ultimate guild. That's like a gold standard guild. So different sorts of gray water systems. The most common one is something called laundry to landscape, where you just hook up your washing machine, uh, the outlet of your washing machine to some plumbing, and it goes outside. So it, it looks something like this. You just you have a system that goes out to fruit trees, not to vegetables. Um, if you're being careful about it, you don't want to get gray water directly on leafy greens and things. Um, I've done it, and I'm still here, but. Um, you know, just to be conservative about it, the, the rules are that you shouldn't do that. And the, the business end of a laundry to landscape system is a really simple little bit of plumbing. There's a three-way valve that takes water from the washing machine, and you can either send it to the sewer, if, say, you're doing a load of bleach or diapers or something like that, then it should go to the sewer. But if you're doing any other sort of laundry uh, with non-toxic stuff in it, with just soap, then it can go out into the yard. And the pump will drive the water and send it right out there. That's the nice thing about the laundry to landscape system is that the, the washing machine's got a pump built in it. And it's a powerful pump. It's actually designed uh, to be able to pump vertically 10 feet. So if it's in the basement of a building, it can pump up to where the pipes are. So you can move a lot of water with these pumps. And you can move it way out into the yard and, and water things. And then the, the other end, the outlet end of a gray water system with laundry to landscape are just different sorts of emitters. A really easy thing is just to put the pipe into an upside down flower pot that's got some holes drilled in it. And that'll just spread the water out nice and evenly. But um, this one in the lower left here is, is not legal. Um, it's just demonstrating gray water coming out of a very easy, I mean, that's, that's really all you need to get gray water on the ground. But you don't ever want to have gray water exposed out in the open. You want it underneath some mulch or, or down in the ground somehow. Um, it's, just, it's just better that way and healthier for you. So all these strategies together then really add up. You know, we're, we're building organic matter in the soil. We're mulching. We're contouring the soil to hold water. We're planting densely and in layers. We're zoning plants according to their water needs. We're catching and reusing water, and we're putting in some sort of good irrigation system if we need it at all. And the result is you put that all together, and you will get something like my friend Mary's yard, where she doesn't need to water more than a, a few times a season as far as using household water is concerned. So, so look at what we've accomplished here. All we, our goal was simply to save water. But we've got this whole slew of benefits coming off of it. We have all these wonderful things happening in the yard. We've made all sorts of beneficial connections. We're getting fresh food, and we're healthier, and we're working less. Mm -hmm.